Well, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Robert Sumwalt, and I'm the chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. And joining us today, we have the vice chairman of the board, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, and the investigator in charge, Pete Katowski. Uh, yesterday was really a travel day for us uh, at the NTSB. We had uh, investigators traveling in from as far away as Seattle, Denver, of course, Washington, and a few other locations. Uh, so today is really the, the first full day of boots on the ground for our investigative team. This morning we held our investigative organizational meeting and that's where we establish our investigative protocols and uh, 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 designate parties to the NTSB's investigation. Now the NTSB investigates those organizations that can provide technical expertise to our investigation we designate those organizations as parties to the investigation. And at this point, the parties to the investigation are the New York State Police and the New York Department of Transportation. As I mentioned yesterday, our investigation is separate and apart from the New York State Police's investigation. They're conducting their investigation as they do for any fatal highway crash and we are conducting, conducting our safety investigation. So they really are distinct, but we are working together and sharing information on those areas that would be of common interest. Uh, we've had several briefings with, uh, with the New York State Police leadership to discuss uh, our processes and to discuss best ways to work together so that we're not encroaching in on their investigation. Uh, and we certainly appreciate uh, their cooperation uh, and assistance and coordination uh, going along. Our teams are examining several different areas. We have, uh, we break our investigations into several uh, disciplines. As far as the operator, we have a group looking at the, at the operator, and when I refer to the operator, I mean the motor carrier, the limousine company. We have had an initial meeting with the limousine company, and uh, as major uh, as the major indicated, um, there's been an in, uh, uh, the motor carrier has uh, indicated a willingness to cooperate with our records request. We will be looking at the operations of the driver and the motor carrier, the actual uh, operations of it. We're looking at the limousine operators compliance with applicable state and federal regulations. We'll also look at the oversight, the actual oversight by the state and federal oversight authorities, agencies, the company's safety culture, the company's records, records of prior crashes, their management of drivers, their fatigue management program, vehicle maintenance, Fitness for dr driver fitness for duty. We want to look at everything that we can related to the company that operated that limousine. The vehicle itself, uh, of course, we are interested in the mechanical condition of the vehicle, uh, inspections of the vehicle subsystems, braking, steering, suspension systems, tires, making sure the right size tires are on there, the, the age of the tires. We're looking for any possible corrosion that may have existed in the vehicle, as well as any vehicle body and frame, in, uh, the vehicle body and frame integrity. And of course, this, this vehicle, a 2001 uh, Ford uh, Expedition, started out life as a traditional expedition, and then it was stretched. So we want to make sure that uh, the vehicle, uh, when it was converted, that, that was uh, the conversion was conducted in accordance with federal regulations. Now the seating configuration, the vehicle was, was seated, was configured for 19 seats. It had a driver seat and a driver and a front seat passenger seat, so two up front. Right behind that, there's of course there's a, part, a partition and there would be a rear facing seat and then in the very rear of the vehicle, a forward-facing seat, and then down both sides would be bench seats. 
with a bar uh, located also on the on the uh, a bar and a door located on the right side of the vehicle. One of the things that we look at is to see whether or not the seating configuration may have may have contributed to the injuries. That's some, what, the type of thing that we typically look at. We've had questions as to whether or not the seats were equipped with seat belts. Um, some seats, we know at this time, some seats were equipped with lap shoulder belts. At this point, we're not sure if all seats, seat, seating positions, were equipped with seat belts. And we are not sure at this point whether or not uh, the seat belts were worn by anyone. Uh, usually we can determine whether or not a seatbelt was worn by looking at the, at the damage to the seatbelt itself. The webbing might be stretched, the, seat atta the attach points for the seatbelt, and uh, the medical uh, examination uh, will oftentimes uh, indicate whether or not a seatbelt was worn at the time of a uh, collision. Now, in the state of New York, seatbelts are required to be worn in limousines they are required to be worn by the driver and front seat driver, uh, front seat passengers. They are not required to be worn by occupants in the rear of the vehicle. Our initial examination has indicated that, uh, um, that some of the seats remained anchored to the floor. And the reason I say some of the seats is that as the, as the vehicle is right now, uh, when the, when the um, emergency response crews are through uh, getting the victims and the wrecker crew is ready to take the, the, the car, uh, the car has been cut open with the jaws of life, so, um, so it's not exactly in the configuration that it was at the time of impact. Furthermore, seats have been removed to extract, uh, extricate uh, the victims. So after they're through with that, they just take all of that and place it back in the vehicle. And so it's not exactly like you can just look inside the car and say, oh, there's a seat belt, there's one, there's one, because there's, there are a lot of items that have been placed back in the vehicle. But over the, over the next few days, we've uh, secured a tent to place uh, over the vehicle. And uh, over the next few days, our investigators will get in there along with the uh, New York State Police and start uh, recreating this, removing that de um, debris that has been placed back in it. As far as the damage to the limousine, just a visual examination would reveal that there is, of course, extensive damage to the front of the car with, with more damage done to the left front of the car. But a lot of damage, intrusion, engine compartment pushed back into the front of the car, certainly indications of, of high energy impact. Uh, tomorrow, once the federal and state offices, uh, once the federal offices uh, reopen after today's holiday, we will be able to uh, get in touch with the DOTs, the U.S. Department of Transportation, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration to get a more complete rundown on the motor carrier, the limousine company itself. Highway factors. We certainly want to look at the highway, the roadways. As you know, the roadway was um, 30, Highway 30 coming down the hill was reconfigured uh, a few years ago from the current T configuration that it currently has. Uh, it used to be as you come down the hill, the road veered off to the left instead of the 90 degree angle that it intercepts 30A now. So we, we want to look at the roadway configuration. We want to look at the roadway conditions, the signage, the geometric design of the highway, um, lighting, traffic volume, any prior, any prior crash history that may um, involve that intersection. And we want to make sure that it complies with the design manuals. AASHTO uh, is the design manual that uh, roadway should be compliant with. We flew a drone uh, today over the site 
um, and we will compare the present roadway with the way the roadway was configured a few years ago. We will also be conducting additional drone measurements and scans tomorrow, and that will involve some lane closures uh, tomorrow. The human performance. Uh, yes, we are certainly interested in any driver medical fitness um, issues that may, may be there. We don't know if there are, but we will be looking into that. We'll be looking to see if fatigue may have been an issue. Uh, the toxicology results, they will be sent to the U.S. Department of Transportation's Civil Air Medical Institute in Oklahoma City, where they will look at um, over a thousand different possible drugs that may be in someone's system. We're, of course, interested in the driver qualifications. We heard the major commenting, commenting on that earlier, uh, and including any uh, crash history or driving infractions. Emergency response, uh, we are looking at the overall emergency response, and we want to thank the first responders, and we're in the process of obtaining the 911 records, call logs. Our investigators will be here probably about five days at this point. Uh, while they're here, they're not here to speculate they're not here to determine the cause. What they are here to do at this point is to collect the perishable information, the information that can go away with the passage of time. And of course, our mission is not only to find out what happened, we know what happened. We know that a car apparently ran a stop sign and had a tragic result. So we're here not to find out just what happened, but why it happened. And our ultimate goal is to keep things like this from happening again. Uh, for the latest information, uh, follow us uh, um, on Twitter, which is our call, our, our sign is uh, at NTSB underscore newsroom, or you can follow us at our website, ntsb.gov. In just a moment, I will call for questions, but once I do, what I'd like for you to do is raise your hand. When I call on you, please uh, state your name and your affiliation. So I'll take, be glad to take your questions right here. Mercedes Williams with Spectrum News. As far as you know, was that uh, vehicle that the crash due to operator error? The question is, as far as I know, was the crash due to operator error? And that would be speculation. And we want to get all the facts. And once we have the facts and we've carefully analyzed those, we will issue a probable cause. But at this point, we're here just to collect the factual information. There's a question right here. Can you explain how that expedition was modified to people at home who are wondering how it's, it's actually broken in half, stretched out, and then this could have had the same brakes as an SUV, not brakes for this large vehicle that would be able to sustain that brake going down that hill? Thank you. Great question. Can we explain how the modification occurred? And Pete, can you, uh, can you take that one? Or? All right, Pete Kutowski. In the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, there's requirements about braking systems on vehicles. Uh, and that's one of the things that is open in this investigation. And as we spoke earlier about the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards will be examined in this case. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question right here. Thanks. Robert Gavin, Time Union in Albany. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you said there was, was certainly indicative of high energy impact. Can you say that? What are you talking about? Well, when we talk about high energy impact, what are we talking about? You can look at the crush damage uh, throughout the vehicle to see that if, a, if, a, if an entire engine block is moved back and basically crushed, moved back past the driver's seat, that would indicate there was a lot of force uh, and energy uh, involved in that crash. Speeding? We didn't say speeding. Uh, we said uh, energy. And uh, kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared, whatever that means. So, so, um, so it's it's a combination of the mass and the um, and the uh, the speed of the vehicle, which would create that type of um, tri type of uh, damage. So, one of the things that we hope to be able to determine is what the speed of the vehicle was at the collision, and I think we have the technology to do that. Let's see. There's a question right here. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, Mike Orland, Newstead. Can you say at this point, is there any evidence that the brakes were being applied at all to slow down or to, to brake at all? Yeah, is there any evidence at all that the uh, brakes were being applied? 
Uh, there's no apparent skid marks. Uh, however, I want to point out that the, the, like, like today and yesterday, on Saturday it was misting, so that could perha perhaps, uh, a damp road could perhaps uh, uh, mitigate any skid marks. Also, the anti-lock uh, anti braking these days uh, are designed to keep uh, cars from skidding. So uh, one of the things we, we should be able to do, and you heard the, heard the major say, they have, I think they said they've recovered the engine control module. Is that, is that what? The uh, airbag. Oh, the airbag. And, and the airbags can tell us uh, uh, pulses, uh, decelerated pulses? Possibly. Possibly. So, so we do not know the speed of the vehicle at, at, the, at the point of impact right here. Chairman Michael Benny with WTBH TV in Syracuse. Um, first of all, welcome to the out-of-towners to upstate New York. But you come from different parts of the country. You're investigating this crash here in our neck of the woods. I'm wondering what's different about this investigation and this crash from the perspective of all the brain power you've got here that's flown in from all over the country. So, I, at first blush, what is it? Yeah, what is the difference between this crash from others that we investigated? And as I said yesterday, uh, the thing that is striking to me and to our team is the, the, the unfortunate number of fatalities. We've got 20 fatalities. So that is, uh, that's very striking. And as I mentioned yesterday, this is the, the, the most deadly transportation accident or crash that we've seen on U.S. soil since February of 2009. So uh, it's, it's definitely uh, something that we're very interested in, and uh, we will follow up and complete recommendations that hopefully will improve the safety of this industry. Mr. Costello. Mr. Sumwalt, is there, do you have any indication whether that vehicle had the so-called black box that a modern vehicle would have, or was it too old? Yeah, Pete, uh, the, what does this vehicle have in terms of black boxes? Pete was talking earlier today. I'll let you take an answer on that. I think it's... Uh, that's, that's, those, uh, that's an area that's still being addressed. Uh, we do know, and as was reported earlier by the major, the, the one component that was recovered uh, is the uh, airbag uh, module. Um, Vehicles change over time, technology changes over time. Uh, we have not uh, completed our examination, nor have the state police, about looking at what other components that may be uh, on the vehicle. Vehicles, uh, passenger vehicles, are typically not um, equipped with the black box that we see in aviation and other modes of transportation. Thank you. There's a question way back here in the back. Okay, a lot of questions there, and I think the first one dealt with, uh, I think you said this had a DOT. Uh, what was the first part of the does question? Does it have any conversion certification? Uh, does it have any conversion certification? And, uh, and so one of the things we want to look at is was that certification done in compliance with the federal requirements for a conversion? As far as the other questions you asked about uh, what the major mentioned earlier today or about uh, the driver's, uh, the, the driver's qualifications, um, that's really in their wheelhouse right now, and uh, we, we will eventually get that information, but right now that's, that's part of the New York State Police's uh, wheelhouse, and you wanted to follow up on that, I think. I, I was referring to federal inspections of the vehicle, not the driver. When was there, when was there a recent inspection? When is this yeah. inspection? So it's not a federal, we're, federal. We're still looking for this document. Okay, thank you. So those are the types of documents that we, we hope to obtain. You might, I know everybody here wants the answers. You all have questions. We have a lot of questions. We're really just on basically our first real day of getting here. And, uh, and we will eventually get those answers. Right now we, we don't have them. It's a question right here. The question is, should there be a greater concern with the traveling public about limousines? And let me just say this, we are here to investigate this particular 
crash to understand the facts, circumstances, and conditions surrounding this crash. However, we can't prevent this accident from happening. This one's already happened. So our larger goal is to see if, in fact, this is a, a more widespread issue. Right now, our focus is just on this one accident, or this one crash. If we find that there are issues there that affect the industry at large, we will address those. Yes, ma'am. I want to make sure we're clear on this. Uh, Governor Cuomo said the New York State Department of Transportation last month inspected this vehicle. The vehicle failed inspection. Can you confirm that? Can I confirm what uh, uh, Governor Cuomo said this morning uh, at 11 o'clock? No, I cannot because we don't have that information. One other question to follow up to her is about the structural integrity and the idea that these, these, these vehicles are stretched and they have to meet certain guidelines. Can you talk generally about how the structural integrity can be harmed or yeah, so the question is, how are these modifications converted? And I want to be clear mm -hmm. that we did not say that stretch limousines are any less safe than other vehicles. That was something that you said, but we don't, it, we feel that if it possibly, we, we, we want to look at the federal requirements, but we want to make sure that the federal requirements are sufficient to ensure there is no different level of safety between a car that rolls off the production line and one that is converted to a limousine. Last question, Mr. Chairman. There's a question right here. Uh, Jesse with the New York Times. I'm confused. So you don't know whether or not this, this vehicle had a federal, federal certification? The vehicle is not required to have a federal certification. But a conversion is certain. All right, I'm going to put, turn that one over to, to, to Pete. That's, that, is, that is one of the things. There's, uh, when vehicles are manufactured, they, are, they have to be in compliance with certain federal motor vehicle safety standards, depending upon the type of vehicle that's, that's involved. Uh, in this particular case, because of the damage, the uh, typical plates that you normally see are plainly in view. Uh, they're not in this particular case. And so there's a great deal of information that we need to seek back from manufacturers uh, and other sources to find out what the FMVSS or the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards were applicable to this vehicle. So you can't actually find the, the, the identifying mark that would tell you whether or not this conversion was legal? Typically, there's, um, there's, a, there's a plate uh, that's attached, very similar to your VIN number on the vehicle. Uh, and because of the damage, it's not, it's not visible to us at this time. So there are other, there are other, other uh, means that we have to look at to verify that information. And we're in the process of gathering that now. At this time, we have not located. That's correct. So I want to thank you all very much. And uh, you can follow us on our Twitter handle or at NTSB for future updates. Thank you very much. Did you touch the White House at all about this crash? Pete?